So hello everyone, uh, my name is Sergio Lopez. I'm, I'm a software engineer working in the virtualization team at Red Hat. And in this presentation, I'm going to introduce you to LibCurrent, a tool, a library that might help you uh, using virtualization-based uh, isolation for your workloads. So uh, let's jump directly to the big question, which is what is LibCurrent? And uh, if I had to define libcurrent in a single quote, it will, that would be that libcurrent is a, a dynamic library that enables other programs to easily gain virtualization-based isolation capabilities with a minimum possible footprint. As a fun fact, originally this quote said uh, KVM-based instead of virtualization-based, and hence the, the, title, the title of this, of this talk. But Likeron has recently, over the last couple of months, also acquired the ability to run VMs using the hypervisor framework of macOS. Mm -hmm. So it's no, it's, no, it's no longer strictly tied to KVM. So uh, let's uh, uh, talk a bit about the goals and goals of Likeron to set the expectations properly. So Likeron intends to be easy to use. Uh, and it tends to integrate all the features needed for its purpose with minimal standard dependencies, be as small as possible in code side, have the minimum possible memory footprint, and provide a friendly environment for microservice and container workloads. At this task point doesn't imply that libcaron cannot be used for other kind of workloads, but uh, we are currently focusing on those two. Also, and this is a very important thing to set the expectations properly, uh, Likkeran does not intend to support conventional virtualization workloads. Uh, in other words, Likkeran is not a replacement for KQMU, is not a replacement for VirtualBox. It cannot, in fact, run a full guest operating system, and there is no intention whatsoever to implement such feature in the future. OK, so what does Likkeran provide, actually? So uh, we have two libraries. One is libcurrent itself, and the other one is libcurrent firmware. And the first one provides C bindings to interact with the library, a virtual machine monitor based on RASVM and Grace and Firecracker, Arch-dependent devices, an integrated via VirtualFS server, and a minimal set of Virtual devices, Virtual console, VirtualFS, Virtual balloon, balloon, but only the uh, free page reporting feature, and Virtual VSOC. And provided by the Quran firmware, we have an interface to access the guest payload, which is what uh, uh, the data that is going to be injected inside the guest memory, and a bundle minimalist, the Linux kernel has a payload. It's very likely that in the near future, uh, Likkeron firmware will also include some kind of minimal firmware, possibly written in Rust, that is needed to be able to run uh, uh, memory encrypted VMs. Okay, so. Some of you may be wondering now that why do this has a dynamic library? Why have all these features has a dynamic, li dynamic library? And to explain this, let me first introduce you to uh, what will be needed if you had a runtime and you wanted to create a VM using an external virtual machine monitor. First, your runtime will need to locate the executable of that virtual machine monitor through the file system and the virtual machine monitor itself will need to locate uh, its dep own dependencies, possibly other libraries, a kernel image, possible, possibly some firmware, everything through the file system. Uh, this is not a problem unless the runtime intends to switch between contexts, in that, which is something that OCI runtimes tend to do. Uh, if that's the case and the runtime switches to a different uh, context with a different mount point namespace, it's very likely that the runtime won't, uh, won't be able to find the VMM, uh, the virtual machine monitor executable through the file system anymore, nor any of its own depend of the dependencies of this last one. Uh, this means that uh, the uh, runtime will need to either avoid switching contexts, which is bad for security, or it will need to uh, somehow carry on the payload between different contexts which can be complicated because uh, the runtime uh, may not know all the uh, dependencies of the virtual machine monitor, and in any case, it won't be really uh, efficient in any way. So what happens if the runtime, runtime is using libcurrent? Well, uh, has the run, if the runtime is using libcurrent, it has, it's, it's actually a link, a guys, uh, dynamically links, a guy libcurrent, a libcurrent firmware, and the moment the runtime is executed, the dynamic loader gets all the uh, all the components from libcurrent and libcurrent firmware inside the uh, process the memory map of the runtime itself. Uh, this way, the runtime can safely uh, switch between contexts, can change to a different mount point namespace, 
and all the uh, data and code that is needed to run the VM will be carried on with, the, with itself. Okay, switching topics, let's talk about doing a storage without block devices. Uh, uh, sort of you have probably noticed that when I enumerated the uh, virtual devices that did current support, there is no, there was no presence for of uh, virtual block wasn't present there, and virtual SCSI wasn't uh, also on the list, neither. And uh, in fact, there is no any uh, device that will allow the uh, the guest to access to any kind of block device. Instead, libcurrent uses virtualfs, uh, which is able to use any directory on the host as the guest root file system. So basically what's happening here is that when the guest operating system needs to access some service on the file, service, file system, it will use Fuse and Virtio MMIO to connect to the, uh, to communicate to the Virtio FS server integrated in libcurrent. And this Virtio FS server will act on behalf of the guest operating system to access the files which are located on the host file system, starting at some directory in the host that is acting as the root file system for the guests. So, Let's take a look at how this works in practice. Okay, uh, so what we have here is ch root vm, which is uh, an example that comes with Liquoron itself. It's linked against uh, Liquoron and Liquoron firmware, and it expects to receive a root file system, a root directory to use as root file system has a first argument. And as a, and a command to be executed inside their file system has the second argument. So uh, what are we doing to do here is I'm going, uh, we are going to create the, uh, a directory that is uh, viable to be used as the root file system in the VM uh, in a completely manual way. So I'm going to create first the directory rootfs, then I'm going to create some support directories inside it. DMP, bin. And now I'm going to copy some binary so we have something to actually execute inside the VMs to have an entry point at least. So what I'm going to use is the busybox binary that is shipped with the Fedora package, which is statically linked, which is very convenient for this kind of use cases. And I'm going to copy it in rotfs bin. And I'm also going to copy it again as sh, so I have a shell that I can use as an entry point inside the, uh, inside the VM. Now I'm going to use ch root vm using root file fs has the root the, uh, has the first argument. Root fs is going to be used as the uh, root file system for the guest for the virtual machine. And bnsh has the uh, command to be executed inside the VM. And here we are, we have a shell that is running inside a completely new, freshly created VM. We don't have any, any commands here, but we can use this is the integrated uh, functionality to provide and install some executed some commands for us. Now, that's better. Now we can, in fact, confirm that we are running on a fresh VM that is running a different kernel than auto, than a host system. Uh, my host system is using a kernel ship with Fedora, and the uh, guest uh, is using a different new world kernel, which is ship, uh, which is bundled within libcurrent firmware. Uh, in addition to uh, run a shell, we can also run uh, any arbitrary ex executable within the, um, uh, within the root file system and even pass arguments to it. Of course, creating the root file system by hand is not really convenient for a daily uh, use base, but I wanted to show it anyway to illustrate how it actually it is to create uh, such uh, a structure. And because I can easily imagine some kind of microservice uh, orchestrator or system to uh, deploy uh, mic those microservices in independent VMs simply by creating this small and simple uh, root file system hierarchy and dropping the static and static binary on it. Of course, there are better ways to create root file systems. For example, you can use OCI images. Um, and for create, managing you know, images, you can use any container tool. I'm going to use Podman here. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new container, which is named Baby Anchor Round, based on an uh, image, on the Debian image. Now I'm going to create a directory to hold the contents of the container, which I'm going to call Debian rootfs. I'm going to export these container contents 
and extract them on this directory. Now my contents are there and I can remove this newly created container and I should be able to execute CXRU the game using Debian rootfs as my root file system. And this time I'm going to use Beam Bash. And here, I, here we are, we have a freshly started VM, but this time using a Debian root file system. Okay, so going back to the presentation, let's talk about the advantages and disadvantages of these mechanisms. So for instance, uh, this uh, using VirtuFS uh, in place that we uh, have a requirement of, for zero storage management. Uh, we don't need to deal with these images or these formats. We don't need to do partitioning or layer, or, you know, we don't need to layer a file system on it. Uh, we don't need to shrink the image, we don't need to grow the image or worry about running out of space. Uh, it also uh, it also means that it's very easy to share files between the host and the guests. We don't need to share. Uh, we, don't need to, uh, we don't need to configure some kind of shared folder or anything, because that's uh, how it works by default. And it's very friendly to microservice and container workloads, which, uh, as we've seen before, is was the uh, one of the main uh, target goals of Flickr run at this point. As of the disadvantages, we can uh, say that the performance is not as good as when using block-based devices mainly because the guest is not able to rely as much in the in his own file system cache uh, as it would be able to do with block based device. Uh, and it needs to uh, communicate it to with the host more frequently for data. But on the other hand, this is actually good to keep our memory footprint low uh, because if the guest is using a significant amount of memory has file system cache, that memory cannot be returned to the host and uh, to be freed. Another disadvantage is that the attack surface is larger than using VirtuO block because we have more code and we have more syscalls. Uh, that said, it's very likely that libcurrent will integrate support for VirtuO block with Shunish. Uh, the main reason is that it's better suite for running encrypted workloads. As we've seen before, the attack surface is lower. Um, we uh, don't need this, that many syscalls, so we, can, uh, as we are also able to uh, build a stricter second policy and uh, what things will do will work in that way uh, in this case is that instead of having some uh, directory on the host, uh, probably there will be some kind of trusted component on the platform that will take the uh, guest payload, whether it is uh, an OCI image or something else. It will create a, uh, a this image. It will lay some kind of encryption on the this image and will uh, store the the payload, uh, the guest payload inside that this image. All things said, if Virtio Block finally gets integrated in libkran, it'll probably be has an independent flavor of the library instead of a configuration option. Uh, the main reason is that I would like to keep libkran as opinionated as possible and not ship features that are not going to be used by the runtime. So switching to another topic, uh, similarly to what will happen with Virtio Block, uh, among the list of Virtio de devices that Libcurrent supports, there is no Virtio Net, nor any other kind of device that will allow the guests to use a virtual network interface. So how are we doing networking without networking interface in the guest? Uh, well, uh, basically we are using a novel approach, which is called Transparent Socket Impersonation, or TSI, which is implemented inside the, in the guest custom kernel provided by Libcurrent firmware and doesn't require any kind of changes on the user space application. So you can use the binary ship with an OCA image or whatever other binaries. And the trick here is that when the user space application requests an AF init socket to the kernel, what it's actually getting is, is an AF TSI socket which is with compatible semantics. This AF, AF, AF TSI socket wraps an AF BSOC socket and AF init socket inside it. So what happens when the user space client uh, attempts to establish a connection to a local endpoint, to something, to some service that uh, is uh, running within the context of the guest operating system itself? Well, in that case, the user space client will request the connection to the TSI socket, not being aware that it's a TSI socket, yeah, the user space client is, thinks it's an AFT in its socket. And the TSI socket would attempt to fulfill that request using the init personality uh, in the first place. 
has there is a user space server in the local context, the, the request is fulfilled, and the connection is established. And the user space client and the user space server can start communicating between them the user way. This is very similar to what would happen if the user space client was using a conventional AFNet socket. But let's see what's happen, what happens if the user space client attempts to connect to an endpoint that is not local to the guest, that is outside the guest, on the host, or in some other uh, uh, network device uh, outside the reach of the guest operating system. So there, at first, the, what happened will be the same. The user space client will request the connection through the uh, TSI socket, and the TSI socket will attempt to fulfill that request using the inet personality. But this time, there is nothing in the guest that will fulfill that, that request. So TSI will uh, attempt to, do, uh, to fulfill that request using this BSOC personality. Uh, the BSOC socket will communicate with the BitIO BSOC device, which is integrated in Liquid Run and running, and running in the context of the runtime, outside the context of the guest. And if the BitIO BSOC uh, device is able to connect to the uh, external endpoint, which again may be located uh, uh, in the same host or in whatever uh, other, uh, or could be whatever other uh, external network resource, if the BIO device is able to connect to it, that, uh, it will establish a connection and the user space client will start communicating with the user space server across boundaries without any of them being actually aware of the situation. This is, this is completely transparent for the, both of them and there is no need for any kind of, of uh, explicit support. And what happens if instead of having a user space client using the TSI socket, we have a user space server? So what happens is that once the, once the user space server starts listening on the TSI socket, which again is not aware it's a TSI, TSI socket, the TSI socket will actually implicitly start listening on both the inet and the BSOC personalities at the same time. If a connection is received through the inet personality, uh, the socket, the, the new socket that will be created to attend that connection, it will be a new TSI socket where the inet personality will be the primary one. And if a connection is received through the BSOC personality, the new socket, uh, TSI socket that will be created will be uh, one with the BSOC personality as the primary one. Okay, so let's see this in action. Uh, what I'm going to do, I'm going to use uh, again root VM with the same root file system we created before, we contain VCBox. And VCBox has an uh, implementation on WGET we can use for this purpose. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start an HTTP server on the host outside the VM, which is listening on port 8000, and I'm going to connect to it from inside the VM. I'm using the IP address of my host. And the connection completes successfully. Uh, again, uh, this, uh, the service, uh, the thermal endpoint doesn't need to be on the, on the host. It can be anywhere else. And if I attempt to connect to an external uh, server, the connection also works. Uh, of course, I can do it the other way around and open a port inside the VM. Then I can, uh, they can uh, I can connect to it from outside the VM from the same host on the port one two three four. Hello from the host. Hello from the VM. So what's actually happening here? If we pay more attention to the uh, socket, is that what's actually listening on, or from the host perspective, what's listening on port 1234 is something called vmdevconf, which has the process ID 2328. And if we search for this process ID, we'll see that uh, it's actually the chroot vm uh, binary we are executing that is linked against libkeran and it's acting as a vmm for this, uh, for this instance for the guest. Okay, so going back to the presentation, let's talk about the advantage and disadvantage of this strategy. Uh, one of the advantages is that the network configuration you need to do on the guest is very minimal. Just You just need to configure the DNS, yeah, but you don't need to configure an IP address. You don't need to configure a gateway or, or any kind of routes. 
Um, it allows Liquor Round to add on behalf of the user space applications running in the guest without the need of implementing a, a TCP network stack in the library. So everything that, that happens between the user space client, the kernel, Liquor Run, and the user space server is happening at a socket level. And from the host perspective, all connections appear to come from and go to the Liquor Round enabled runtime and are visible in the network namespace of the runtime's context. And there is no need to use network reaches nor IP table rules. And as a result of all the above, the EI environment is really friendly to container workloads to the point that things such as Istio sidecars word of, of the box without any kind of explicit support for Liquor Run. As of these advantages, we can say that it requires explicit support for each address family. And at the moment, only AF net streams are supported, though uh, it's very likely that AF in support for AF datagrams is going to arrive very soon. And there is no support for row sockets. So uh, before jumping to the next section, I would like to talk a bit about memory footprint, which is, uh, I totally would uh, like to talk more about this. Uh, because it's a very important topic for Liquor Run. But the problem is that it's a very complex topic. It requires a lot of time to establish the proper context to be able to explain what is actually you are actually measuring and to actually show what's happening. And I couldn't find a way to fit this into this presentation. I will probably write a blog post or something, or perhaps some documentation in the Liquor Run repository. But anyway, I would like to highlight some strategies implemented in Liquor Run. One of them is that the kernel payload is directly injected from the library mapping into the VNC space, allowing the read-only section to be shared between multiple instances. Uh, this is true only for the KVN implementation, has the uh, hypervisor framework on macOS, for some reason does not allow to build the VM uh, space with more than one region. Uh, Likeron is also using a minimalist kernel, both in features and in capabilities. Uh, this kernel is, has a limited amount of CPUs it cannot use. Uh, it has a limited amount of RAM it can address. And all of the, that contributes to uh, lowering the uh, footprint of the, uh, of the library. Uh, there is minimalism in the code. We already see that. We are only shipping the devices we need. And even on those cases, we are only implementing the features of the devices that we are actually going to use. And we are also Virtualion Balloon with free page reporting, which is a cool feature that allows uh, Virtualion Balloon to the guest to periodically report to the host which, page, which pages are no longer in use, so the host can return them to the free pool. And something that is work in progress, that uh, but I hope that will arrive soon, uh, arrive soon, is the ability to use VitaliFS with direct access with DAX. Uh, this allows us to uh, bypass the guest uh, the guest file system cache which is something we talked a bit about before. And this is actually good because it allows to uh, ensure the guest is using, uh, is keeping, is using as few memory as possible in, on its side, so we can keep the memory footprint um, as small as possible. If the guest was using a significant amount of memory has five system cache, the cache, that memory won't be able to be returned, could be returned to the host. So let's stop talking about Liquor Run itself, itself and let's talk about how you can use Liquor Run. First of all, how can you obtain Liquor Run? Uh, being a relatively new project, Liquor Run is not just shipped by any distribution officially, but there are unofficial repositories for Fedora, for OpenSUSE, and for macOS. You can also, of course, build in from sources. I think it's, relatively, it's a thing relatively simple to do. Uh, you need to do it in, the, in, the, in this order. You need to build Liquor Run firmware first and then Liquor Run itself. And once you have all the software in place, you only have to worry about one single header, which include, includes all the documentation for each function and for the Liquor Run library, which will bring Liquor Run firmware by itself because it's, it's dynam dynamically linked against it. This is a minimal example of using Liquor Run in under 10 days of code. Uh, this will create a VM, a lightweight VM with just one uh, BCPU and 512 megabytes of RAM using root FS, has the root file system, and being a switch has the, um, has the command to be executed inside the VM has entry point with no arguments and an empty environment. Of course, I don't expect anyone to be using the program this way because we are ignoring any kind of error codes. But I still think it's a nice way to illustrate how easy it can be to create a lightweight VM using Liquor Run. Uh, 
So in fact, let's pick up this code, paste it to a file, compile it, and here we have again our fresh VM. Same thing as we had with chroot, but with all minimal example. Okay, back to the presentation. And lastly, I would like to uh, give some examples and use cases of uh, projects that are uh, uh, some idea that may give you some ideas of what you can do with Liquid Run. Uh, for instance, there are already some projects that are using Liquid Run, such as uh, KRun VM which is a tool for creating like with VMs from OCA images using Likaran and Builda. Um, in fact, I think we are good on time. Yeah, let's uh, try, let's take a minute and let's soak Likaran VM a little. In, uh, and to, I'm going to take this opportunity also to illustrate how Likaran also works on non-Linux platforms. I'm connecting to the uh, Mac M1 device that I have right here. You can see this is our Darwin system. And uh, with KRAM VM list, we can see the, uh, the configuration that we have for uh, the, the virtual machines that we have already defined. We have a Fedora test image. I'm going to create a new one based on Ubuntu. Um, the, uh, the, uh, what I am specifying here is the image name in the same way you will do with any container. So instead of Ubuntu, this could be Nginx or whatever other image uh, that is uh, publicly available. In fact, you can also specify the tag you want to use. And I'm going to be giving the name Ubuntu DevCon. This will take a few seconds. And now I have my newly created VM. And I can go right away. And well, I I'm going to increase the run. Well, I can study it directly. Let's study it directly. So here we have what well, this is the this is VNSH. Let's use build bash instead. Here we have our freshly started like with VM on Mac OS on a foreign operating system and uh, has thanks to PSI despite well I don't know conflict no okay anyway trust me there is no other interface than the load back interface but despite that i can connect i can start right away installing uh, updating my package package repositories and install wherever i want to install to com uh, convert this into a build machine in fact i could also if i want to i could also change this vm To share an additional directory, for example, my own root file system, my own uh, home, uh, home directory inside the guest. And now I have access to my, my own uh, the, to my own home file system from within the VM. Okay, back to the presentation. Another cool project that is already supporting uh, libkerun is CRun which is the OCI runtime used by Podman. And this one is particularly cool because if you uh, enable, you instruct CRUN to use, to enable uh, virtualization-based isolation, uh, it will do that inside the container context. So you will get container isolation and virtualization-based isolation at the same time. Uh, other ideas that uh, we are exploring with Liquid Run is the ability to run fully encrypted workloads using hardware support with uh, such as AMD, SAV, SMP, and Intel TDX. Other ideas is having the ability to uh, have conventional services to self-isolate. Uh, there are already uh, some services such as HTTP servers that are able to use CHROOT to self-isolate. And it will be cool that in addition to use CHROOT, they will be able to self-isolate in their own VM without any kind of maintenance cost for the system administrator, simply by enabling some kind of configuration on the, on the service itself. And lastly, the other idea would be uh, enable a microservice platform to deploy functions in virtualization isolated environments, which is something we already hinted before when we were talking about how easy it is to create a roof system and drop some kind of a static binary in it. 
and that's all I, I have. Uh, thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, I will, will be more than happy to try to answer them. Okay, thank you, Sergio. We sure have some questions from, from the attendees here in our Q&A. Uh, the first question is for is from Jen Yan. Uh, should KCM memory data work with these thin VMs? Uh, it probably good. Uh, yeah, I uh, it's probably will work too. I haven't tested it, uh, be, um, but I'm not sure if the cost uh, of the running KSM, KSM will be uh, will compensate the uh, uh, the benefit because in the end, uh, most uh, you will your front footprint uh, will be something or your unique footprint will be um, no better say your not unique footprint of each VM will be something like. 100 megabytes for each instance or something like that. So, yeah, I, I don't know if you will be, but it's, it's something that is worth exploring. Okay. Our next question is from Stefan. How is prop populated inside the VM? Is there some kind of init process inside the VM that it also sets up standard file system mounts? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, inside libcurl run, inside the virtualfs server, there is uh, an integrated uh, init binary that is bundled within the, the virtualfs uh, server, and it's, it has a special inode number, and uh, it is the in charge of mounting on the uh, the son of the directories, setting up the environment, uh, um, and doing some other of uh, minimal initialization stuff. Okay. The next question is from Andrea. Does this project match CATA container need to spawn a very light VM to run a container in it? Not exactly. Uh, so uh, CATA container uh, works by running multiple VMs, uh, multiple containers in a single VM when you are using a pod. While on libcurl each VM gets, each container, sorry, gets its, its own VM. So if you happen to have a pod, uh, what will happen is that you have uh, those containers sharing the same uh, uh, mount point in space, the same network in space, probably, but each of those containers will be running in, uh, in different VMs that will be communicating among them using VirtualFS through the mount point in space and TSI through the uh, network in space. Our last question is from Alexander. Is anything similar to Kimus that shouting or Podman's cryo power checkpoint restore in scope for Lipkey run? N not so far. The idea is the Lipkey run should be as simple as possible and um, the, the dive cycle should be relatively simple. So the idea is that the uh, VM will start and will die and there will no support for uh, life migration or even uh, to save the state in any case. But again, this is something that may be worth exploring at some point. Okay. 